Today, I'm here with Professor Ashish Jha, who is currently Professor of Global Health at Harvard and the Director of the Harvard Global Health Institute. He's a practicing general internist and also Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. He will be the new Dean of Public Health at Brown University in fall 2020. Greetings, Professor Jha, and welcome to Underlying Conditions and welcome to Brown. So I'm gonna just jump right in the deep end um, and focus on race and health right from the start. Um, right now, the CDC website currently says the following. The conditions in which people live, learn, work, and play contribute to their health. These conditions, over time, lead to different levels of health risks, needs, and outcomes among some people in certain racial and ethnic minority groups. What can you tell us about the coronavirus's impact on these vulnerable communities of color today? Yeah. Um, so thank you for taking on this discussion. Um, I think this is a topic that has gotten way too little attention in our country. Um, the data, and it's really data that's emerging now, and we should talk about why it took so long for the data to come out on this. Mm -hmm. But the data that is coming out uh, shows several things. Shows that uh, African Americans, for instance, um, have much higher rates of infection from coronavirus. And even among those who have been infected, uh, the mortality rates among African Americans is dramatically higher than it is uh, for everybody else. And, uh, and we've seen that in community after community. Uh, we saw it in New York, we've seen it in Detroit, we've seen it in New Orleans, we've seen it uh, really across the country. Uh, and it's a pattern that I think it took us too long to identify. And in retrospect, as we have started seeing the data, you could easily argue that we should have seen it coming and we should have predicted and we should have done a lot more uh, to try to head this off. Uh, but here we are uh, and we've got to begin to address it. So what would you say specifically accounts for these stark rates of, in, of higher levels of infection and severity of illness and deaths um, for the, the coronavirus for African-American communities? Can you just outline some of the factors? Um, you know, as you may recall, um, President Trump said during one of his press conferences that he didn't know why and he, they were going to look into it. And so I, I'm pretty sure there are some reasons you might have in mind, and I'm wondering if you could share them with, uh, with our listeners. Absolutely. So, um, so obviously we don't know all of it with great precision, but that is not the same thing as we know nothing about this at all. We actually know quite a bit. Um, so when we begin, and let's actually break it into two different issues. One is why the higher rates of infections? And then the second, uh, given higher rates of infections, why such worse outcomes? And I think mm -hmm. they are related but different set of issues. So why higher rates of infections? Um, so I think it has a lot to do with where people live, where they work, the kinds of job opportunities. Um, when you look at African Americans, and again, the big hits have been in cities. Uh, if you look at the people that we have thought about as essential workers, uh, people who are uh, grocery store clerks, people who have to, who are uh, hourly wage workers, people for whom social distancing, working at home through Zoom is not the same kind of opportunity as it is for many of us. Um, if you look at that population, it is disproportionately poor. And there are more African Americans in that population, people for whom uh, that kind of social distancing is not an opportunity. Um, second, I think things like people then having to travel through public transport, transportation. I actually think we've done way too little thinking about so, uh, public transportation and how much of a, of a factor it's been in transmission uh, in places like, uh, places like New York. And then working in conditions where um, social distancing is not possible. So even if at the workplace being exposed. And uh, again, it's one of those things where in retrospect, this should have, we should have seen this coming, but we really weren't looking at it proactively. We weren't paying attention. And now what we see is much, much higher rates of infection in the African-American community. So why were we not paying attention? Um, there, there are a couple of aspects to that. And, and, and to be perfectly honest, I'm not, I don't know. Like one part of it certainly is this entire outbreak, we have been flying blind. We have just had so little data. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really a failure of the federal government um, to, it's usually the federal government, the CDC that we began with, uh, that is the source of our data on these things. And the CDC has not been collecting this data, has not, they are now, but they weren't for months. 
Uh, and that is completely puzzling and frustrating. And, and many of us couldn't understand why. And when we would reach out to the CDC, there was always a, we're working on it, we will collect it, we'll have it. And you ultimately come to realize it was never, it was never there. Hmm. Uh, only when it emerged from other sources did the CDC essentially get shamed into uh, starting to do this. So that's been deeply distressing, is our federal agencies that are supposed to be helping us collect the data and share it with the public health community so we can understand it and react to it, uh, weren't. Um, but of course, the other part of it is, uh, I think for policymakers, they weren't paying enough attention to the fact that this was likely an expected outcome, that we would see certain communities hit much harder with infection rates uh, than others. And, and we should have a longer conversation about why policy uh, makers did not pay attention to that, but, but they didn't. Right. There is a second part of this, which is even when you look at among people who are infected, um, you see much worse outcomes right. for certain groups. And that then raises a whole set of different issues. What's going on there? And to me, there are probably a whole host of factors, but let's talk about three or four of them. Uh, one of them uh, is underlying comorbid conditions. We know that hypertension and diabetes are both substantial risk factors for bad outcomes. And we know that hypertension and diabetes rates are higher in the African American community. So that might be a contributing factor. Um, the factors that contribute to hypertension and diabetes are also very complex and are driven by a whole variety of underlying conditions. So we can come back to that. But the bottom line is we know hypertension rates, for instance, are higher in the African American community. Um, I think that's part of the story. I don't think that's anywhere near the full story. Um, I think another part of the story, um, which has gotten very little attention, uh, has actually been around local environment, air pollution. There's this entire interesting uh, emerging body of evidence uh, that for people who've been exposed to poor quality air for long periods of time, that they tend to do much, much worse with the coronavirus. Mm. And we know that air pollution in a city is not equally distributed in every community and in every neighborhood. That certain neighborhoods tend to have much more locally polluted air, where bus depots are put in, where uh, traffic congestion is particularly bad. Mm -hmm. And there's very good evidence uh, that uh, African Americans tend to live in communities where the quality of the air tends to be poor. And so I think that's a contributing factor. Mm -hmm. But if you get away from those, um, there are also really health system issues that are very, very important. So issues around access to care makes a big difference. So you can be infected, um, but if you have a hard time getting tested because the testing sites are not in your community, they're in a different place. If there are bar financial barriers, we claim that, okay, we're not going to have to make anybody pay for the test. That's good. But that's only one part of the financial barrier. And there may be a whole visit. And what if it turns out not to be coronavirus, but something else? And now you have to pay for that visit. So there are these financial challenges. Mm. And then a whole host of issues around the, the provider organizations that disproportionately care for minority populations. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of work we did um, years ago now uh, looked at hospitals, for instance, that disproportionately cared for African Americans. Um, and what we find, or what we found then, which I suspect is, is true today, is that these hospitals, they're very interesting, and there's a whole historical basis for why people go to certain hospitals and not others. Um, and, you know, it, we don't have to go that far back in history to remember a time when hospitals were segregated. It wasn't even a choice of where you went. And, and those historical segregation uh, policies even though they're illegal now, have long-term remnants and effects. And so uh, it's just not random where African-Americans get their hospital care versus where white Americans might get their hospital. Right. And what we know is that the hospitals that disproportionately care for minority populations, and particularly African-American populations, tend to be poorer quality, tend to have fewer resources. Um, and so even if you end up sick and end up at a hospital, you may be at a place that can do less for you. Mm. Put all of those pieces together and it is not surprising, uh, given both the social factors and the health system factors, that you have much worse outcomes in, in uh, the African-American community. And there are probably other factors that I'm missing, but at least those are the ones that come to mind as kind of some of the issues that I'm sure are surely at, at play. Right, right. I think that's very, uh, you know, there hasn't been much focused discussion about the hospital care quality. There's been some uh, reports of what researchers have already also identified as, you know, individual care providers 
you know, not responding to black patients on a on the same basis that they would others, either not offering tests or not offering pain medicine. You know, there's been research on that. Yeah. Um, but but what you're describing is something a bit more systemic that a whole pra a set of networks of sort of physical segregation coupled with um, medical service segregation, a history of it, right, reinforces um, a kind of negative health outcome. Uh, yeah, that that's very interesting. Um, so, you know, it, yeah, I was just going to say one very quick thing. Um, yeah, of one course. of my um, one of my heroes, somebody I've just inspired a lot of the work I did early in this was um, uh, former Surgeon General of the United States, David Satcher. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Satcher had a great line. I was on a on a television show with him one day. And we were talking about some of the work and he said, you know, I had always hoped that despite all the inequities in our society, I'd always hoped that the healthcare system would be part of the solution. Mm. And it turns out over and over again, we see that it ends up being part of the problem. And I've always sort of, that's such a great line because the idea is there are all sorts of things that, that drive inequities in health. Um, but the health system, like once you get in, it should be the place where we begin to close some of those gaps. And sometimes it is. But sometimes it actually makes those gaps worse. And that, to me, is really both shocking and unacceptable. And it's an area that we need to do a lot more work. On. Yeah, yes, for sure. So, you know, um, can you connect the important details that you're sharing with us here, right? The, the critical understanding of the social determinants of health in general and racial disparities. Can you connect that to um, how that would influence our understanding of public health, right? Because, you know, there's a, there's a tendency to think of public health uh, in ways that don't grasp the, the impact of this kind of data. It just becomes like a problem that we have, right? Well, gee, this is unfortunate. There's disparate racial outcomes. Okay. But it seems there's something more significant and impactful here. And I'm wondering if you could quickly tease out what that might be. Yeah, so there are a couple of ways of, of thinking about that. I mean, first, the, the headline numbers around outcomes, I mean, they're shocking. But what, what I think we're learning is that the factors that underlying it are deep and persistent, but not unaddressable. One of the things that I find very frustrating is a lot of people then throw up their hands and say, well, we can't do anything about this. And I think that is uh, I think that's just fundamentally wrong. I, I, it's not even an issue of I don't agree. I think that's just wrong. There's a lot we can do. Um, but I, I think that it first takes a real deep understanding of the social factors that drive these kinds of outcomes. And, uh, and they are social factors that drive outcomes for everybody. Um, so it's, they play out in certain ways for certain communities. But what we have learned over time is that your local environment, your, uh, the air you breathe, the the, the access to health services in your community, the financial resources in your community, they all have profound effects on your health. And that's true for everybody. Uh, but it also means that other policies or other forms of discrimination end up manifesting themselves in health outcomes, right? So discrimination in employment or discrimination in housing, maybe they are, deeply problematic unto themselves, but they will end up having big health effects as well. And so you're not going to solve all the health problems without thinking about those other issues. And I think, um, you know, the discrimination in housing will end up having some people live in certain neighborhoods where the air quality is not, is, is less uh, good. And that means if they get a coronavirus, they're going to have worse outcomes. Um, I think that's what this is reminding us that, that these are very complex um, interwebs. But as I said, but not ones where we want to throw up our hands. I think there's some very specific policy solutions uh, that are very tangible, even on coronavirus, which I think uh, need to be implemented um, that I, I want us to get moving on. Yeah. Can you give us one quick example of what that might be? Just some yeah, so one, want to know. Yeah. So, of course, there's some things like we have to make it easier for people to stay home, that we should not force people to choose between losing your job or losing your life. Like that is not a set of choices that anybody should have to make. And so policies around letting people stay home uh, and get uh, either unemployment or get other through other types of compensation, that's a, that's a simple policy. And some states are doing it and many states are not. Many states are saying, if your work is open and they're letting you come in, you have to come or you're not going to collect unemployment. Mm -hmm. I think that's unacceptable. On, each, on health stuff, we need to open up more testing capacity and testing capability in communities uh, where people are more vulnerable. 
And we have not used that strategy for testing and targeting of our testing. And I think that's something we can do relatively easily. And then, of course, trying to reduce the financial barriers and the cultural barriers that prevent people from going to the healthcare system is, again, things that we can make a, a progress on, not solve completely, but make progress on on relatively short notice. Right, right. In fact, you know, there seemed to be, you know, an effort to do some um, drive up testing uh, in poor communities of color. But of course, they discovered, which if you'd been paying any attention whatsoever, you would know that a lot of poor people don't have vehicles. They're expensive, expensive to insure, expensive to pay for and maintain. And so they wouldn't let people walk up even if they were you know, six or 10 feet away from the previous uh, yeah. uh, pedestrian or, or vehicle. So you know, it's, um, it's a really shocking disconnect between what people who are economically and socially marginalized experience and that it just doesn't show up in the yeah. imagination, right? And, they, and they're not quick to re revise it, which seems uh, like a whole nother set of, of concerns. But uh, I'm sure you, you can't address that. That's, that's outside of either one of our bailiwick. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, you've, you've been uh, all over, you know, a variety of news outlets, and, and I'm sure you've been talking with researchers and uh, medical professionals, you know, on nonstop at this point. And I'm wondering if there has been a moment, a story or an experience that you feel kind of captures the current moment that we're in or that you found particularly you know, surprising or, or inspiring. Of course, we'll take all the inspiration we can get at this point. But is there, is there a story that you'd wanna share about what your experiences have been about? In the, in the context of this, uh, of this outbreak, Yes. Well, I mean, you can tell any story you wish, no. but I was thinking in the context of the of the uh, virus. Yes. Yeah. Or, I mean, you know, it could be about your history of experience with race and public health. I mean, that's yeah. relevant here as well. Yeah. Directly. But let me let me start off by maybe just saying that I, I remember um, actually being in my office, uh, uh, looking at my computer and seeing the for the first time the data on the the, the sort of vast racial disparities, both in, in infection rates and in outcomes um, between African-Americans and, and, and whites. And um, I immediately hearkened back to a story of, a, of one of the sort of most formative experiences for me as a clinician um, was as an intern, this is now many, many years ago, I won't say how many years ago, um, uh, at the VA hospital in San Francisco taking care of an African-American patient. And I remember for months struggling um, with, with this person that I had just taken on as a primary care physician. Um, I felt like he wasn't listening to my recommendations. I, he, I was trying my best to do what I thought was clinically right. And it took one day after trying to have a very clinical approach, I, he came back to my office. So he clearly trusted me enough to come back. Mm -hmm. And instead of like prescribing whatever I thought he needed, we ended up having this almost hour long conversation about his experience with the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And I remember him describing his lived experience of being maltreated, being ignored. Um, when he actually, he, he was one of those people, it's a classic story of he had had a leg fracture and remember he described sitting in the emergency room for eight hours and not getting any pain medicine. And I just remember that moment, it shaped, I think hopefully in a, in a positive way, my clinical practice, the, the distrust that so many people feel with the healthcare system and the way it creates barriers to accessing care and all of the downstream effects that, that um, those barriers have. And if we do not under, address those underlying issues that create that distrust, we are not going to make progress on health equity in this country. And I remember seeing the data on um, on the disparate outcomes for COVID patients. And I, I did actually have a little flashback to that patient and that experience and realizing that these deep issues of, uh, of distrust that come from real historical behavior on part of the healthcare system towards African-Americans. So this is not a made up distrust. There is a, a long history of behavior. Mm -hmm. How it still continues to manifest itself today, that even somebody today who gets COVID, uh, it may be more hesitant to go seek out care because they don't know what kind of care they're going to get. They don't know how they're going to be treated. They don't know if they're going to be treated with dignity and respect. And all of those issues end up being very, very important. And they show up at moments like this 
So that's not a particular specific story, but it is a yeah. very specific memory that I have uh, that continues to shape how I think no, about these things. I, th I think that's terribly relevant. And, you know, I mean, just imagine I've only watched the nightly news every other day because I can't take it every day. And most of those uh, episodes are watching people who are not African-American, you know, lining hallways in hospitals, dying in waiting rooms. So one could say that your VA patient might say to himself, if they're being treated that way <laughs> now, I'm not going at all. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. I was treated like that before the pandemic. So, you know, right. what Lord knows what I'm what's going to happen to me. So, I mean, I think that's absolutely connected to, to where we are now. Um, so um, what would you say, I mean, is, and there may not be an answer to this quite yet, and if it isn't, that's perfectly fine, but I'm just wondering what you would say are the sort of the biggest lessons learned by health and medicine practitioners and fields um, from the handling of the coronavirus situation with particular reference to race and ethnicity. Are there any big lessons that are already pretty much, you know, understood as, as learned, right, as, as significant? Well, I mean, the, the overarching, one overarching lesson, which I think is obvious, is all of, the, all of the fissures in our society, all of the inequities in our society, all of the, they get highlighted and heightened in a pandemic. And so any of the problems that we've had before, any of the things we have failed to address, those failures become so much brighter and louder and, and, and more in front of us. And when you see the shockingly high rates of death in, in the African-American community, to me, it's a reminder that there are just these large set of issues on inequities that we have not been addressing for a long time. And what a pandemic does is really makes them much more apparent. Um, so that, I think, has been one overriding theme in all of this. Mm. Um, of course, another one is if you aren't proactive and you aren't thinking through these issues, um, you're not going to spot it until it's really late in the game. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for a lot of policy issues, for instance, on, and a lot of times on health policy, one of the things that I've often advocated for is every time you put in a policy, any implementation, any evaluation, you got to look at data stratified by race, you got to look at stratified by ethnicity, you got to look at it stratified by gender up front because you don't know where the disparities are gonna show up. Right. And waiting until someone does the study five years later is way too late in the game. And this, again, is an example of that, um, that we didn't do that. that. That's a lesson that many of us have been advocating for a, a policy, but we didn't do it, and here we are. So I think there are a couple, um, but I also think that I've, I've been ha uh, heartened by the response that a lot of people have had, uh, that we've gotta, um, both address this now and think about in the future waves, if there's a second wave in the fall, how do we do a much, much better job so we don't find ourselves having this exact same conversation? Right, right, for sure. So thinking about the fall and the idea that we could go back to some kind of new normal, right, that we might get to leave our homes at some point, um, you know, I wonder what um, you think we might, uh, let me just rephrase that. Hold on a second. Um, as as we return to what we hope is an open society in the fall, and we look toward reopening, the idea of returning to quote normal without making some fundamental changes would be a missed opportunity. It seems to me. I mean, given all that you're saying about you know what these systemic inequities generate. Um, so, what would you say? might be one factor for a thoughtful, responsible, inclusive new normal that takes into account the kinds of histories and disparities and a kind of accumulated chronic risks that um, African Americans and other communities of color might be facing. Yeah, so I, I think that's a, it's a great question. And, and as we formulate a policy for the summer into the fall, how we're gonna get through the next wave, um, much more uh, engagement, much deeper engagement uh, with people um, of color, uh, people um, of different backgrounds. Uh, because when you think about the, the thing we discussed earlier of the drive-throughs, uh, that's such an incredibly amateur mistake of you put, in a, uh, you put in a testing that only allows for people to drive through. Anybody who knows that community, has experienced living in that community, would tell you upfront that's a bad idea. 
uh, that you need to be much more flexible. Um, but the reason it didn't come up is because the people who built that policy probably had not done the work of engaging with folks who live there and really understanding how would they use it. So the fundamental thing that I would like to see done differently is policies made less in kind of you know, ivory tower, and I don't mean that in just in terms of academia, I think even in government, um, uh, uh, policies made much more on the ground with input from people who are going to actually have to live with those policies and will allow us to do this much better. And then, of course, I wouldn't be me if I wouldn't then also say, we got to have data, 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 so we know that all the stuff we're doing is actually working and, and making a difference in making sure that we don't create big inequities again. Right. Yes, very much so. And so, you know, thinking even beyond the fall and imagining how this pandemic might impact our way of functioning in the, in the future in general, um, are there any additional sort of fundamental changes that we need to make about health in general, right, about risks, about pandemics, about disease um, that would safeguard a better future for us all? Yeah, so the topic of uh, social determinants and addressing them has kind of swirled around for a while. But I think uh, if this pandemic doesn't help us uh, understand how important they are and how much they need to be addressed, then I don't know what will. And so I'm hoping it generates political and social momentum to start addressing some of those things. So I have sort of almost gave it as a given that, yes, we know African-Americans have higher hypertension. Well, why? And what are the factors that drive that? And until we address that, we're not gonna make progress in the long run. So I'm hoping that this allows us to have a much more frank conversation about the factors that underlie these things that we have to begin to address, uh, not just for the next pandemic, but just for improving health and well-being of people overall. Right, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. And this was a great conversation. Thank we, you uh, so we really look forward to having you at Brown. So we'll see you in a couple of months, hopefully in person. Yes, I look forward to it. Definitely in person. I think we'll be able to do that safely. And I'm very much looking forward to working with you and, and spending Excellent. time. Excellent. Yes, we'll find things to do for sure. Thanks again, Professor. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.